what you are looking at is art that is three-dimensional. Not three-dimensional because he uses three dimensions, three physical dimensions. It is three-dimensional because he tells three different stories. First, you have the aesthetics of the art. You see the drawing, you see the painting, you see the forms on the paper. Then as you look at the art and you look at what is actually depicted on the painting, you find that there are characters and each character has a story to tell. Whether it is a woman, whether it is Poseidon, whether it is the Minotaur, each has a story and they tell the story individually inside the painting. And then there's a third layer, which is the philosophical layer, where you actually link all the elements of the painting together to reflect my own philosophy of the world. Many writers have stated that art and philosophy do not mix. Actually, it is a misnomer because from the very beginning, Socrates was interested in defining beauty and defining what is the work of art. How do you define what makes a statue better than another statue? And then there was this idea as we went through philosophy that the two of them were not linked. And Albert Camus, even in 1960, declared that art and philosophy were two separate entities. I disagree with this. The artist has to have a philosophy, and every artist has had a philosophy, whether he knew it or not. When you look at the Hudson Valley School of Painting, you look at landscapes, and for the uneducated viewer, the landscapes are simple landscapes with a river and trees and so forth. But actually, these people, like Cole, depicted a philosophy of life, how man subjugated nature to his will. So there is a philosophy in these paintings. And what I'm saying today is the forism is the merging of philosophy and art into a new movement that actually glorifies philosophy in art. has been with human beings from the very beginning. Whether you look at the cave paintings or little statuettes that were found that are 44,000 years old, because these are the, probably the oldest ones we found uh, to date. Art is at the center of the human mind. And art is more powerful than politics. It's more powerful than violence. Art survives through the centuries and influences how people think. If you look at the Impressionist painters, they were completely rejected by society. They were laughed at. But today, what do we, we laugh not at the Impressionist painters, we laugh at the regime that tried to oppress them and suppress them. We laugh at the Second Empire of France. We laugh at Napoleon III, who was nothing but a mockery of his great uncle. But we respect the Impressionist painters, art as one over politics, and it will always win over politics. Art is the essence of human beings. You cannot survive without art. And it is clear that when you look at ancient history, who do you remember? Do you remember Sparta, that only had generals and fighting and no art whatsoever? Or do you remember Athens, which had art, sculpture, philosophers, and influenced the entire Western world. Which one is more powerful? 
humans are motivated by three things. Sex, power, and money. That's it. There's no other motivation. So the sex or the sexual connotations have been denied by modern society because of different uh, religious philosophies that make the sexual act a sin or uh, something you need to hide as if humans never had sex to reproduce. So my art reflects the human condition. Human condition is the pursuit of sexual pleasure, whether it is to procreate or to enjoy sex by itself. So the paintings reflect the obsession almost of sexual uh, gratification. Violence, of course, is not a motivator of people. However, men are in love with war. Men are obsessed by war. Men are addicted to war. And the paintings reflect this deep-rooted love of violence and of the act of killing. There is a very dark side to the human mind, and especially in the white race, which is by far the most destructive race ever, that we are driven by this um, love affair with war. It is uh, Marinetti in the Futurist uh, Manifesto who said, I love war. I like the, I love the act of killing. This is a reflect, that was, and that was in 1911. So this is a honest reflection of the human mind. And all the paintings reflect this obsession with war and the soldier and the glorification of the people who go to war. When we go to school, who do we learn about? Do we learn about Louis Pasteur, who basically invented vaccination? Or, or do we learn about Napoleon? Do we learn about Wellington, the Duke of Wellington? Do you learn about uh, the great generals of, uh, of the ages? And we learn about wars, history, is a collection of wars, and that's what we are taught. There's a reason why we are taught that. It's because we love it. How could you justify going to war in 1914 and killing millions of young men who voluntarily joined the army to go fight for their country? It is because they love war. War is exciting. War is fantastic. And you can kill without any retribution. And deep inside, humans are killers. Well, the classical element and the mythological element, in classical you mean ancient Greece. The, there are two books that were basically the first books that we have inherited from the Greeks, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And in these books, uh, Homer, should he be actually the uh, author of the books or not, is really immaterial. But the author of these two books has actually laid the foundation of human thinking and of philosophy in these books. Although Homer is not a philosopher, what he wrote is at the basis of philosophical thinking. And when you look at Socrates, many times both Socrates and Plato refer not only to the Iliad and the Odyssey, but to the other books of the, uh, of the Cypriad uh, series to make points about philosophy. So when you look at the Odyssey, people look at it as an adventure of Ulysses or Odysseus trying to get back home. The uh, the book is about the travels of men through life and all the obstacles he has to fight and all the challenges he has to face. 
So these are very important to be able to describe human condition today. And, and the, the mythology is actually every piece of the mythology, every myth that you have is actually related to some type of human condition that the myth is trying to illustrate that you should not pursue. Well, this painting is called Promanteia, which is a Greek word, which is actually also an English word, that describes the privilege accorded to a Greek city to have an oracle. So in this painting, you see, first of all, the word Promanteia is prominently displayed. And you see a very colorful painting with a beautiful girl, which is uh, topless. And uh, the painting is inviting. Actually, uh, it is a very ominous painting because again, you go through the three layers, the aesthetics of the painting, color, attractive young woman. And then you go through, who is she? She is actually the oracle. She is the Sphinx. That's why she has uh, wings that are uh, deployed and very rich in color, gold and uh, lapis lazuli, because she is a very powerful person who can actually predict the future. And then behind it, you have the other story of Oedipus Rex, who is, uh, whose face is above her and it reflects the tragedy that she uh, actually predicts and that humans try to avoid but cannot. So this painting, again, is the three layers of forism that you find in all the paintings. And in the end, you will see that the painting uh, has the eyes of uh, Oedipus bleeding and the blood will actually drip onto the Sphinx breasts and down into the painting into the mountains on which the temple where the Sphinx normally or the Oracle normally predicts the future is located. So it is it is also a surrealistic part in the sense that you have leaves that are flying around but again the leaves reflect uh, the view of Homer, who states in the Iliad, men are like the leaves of a tree. Every season they will fall in the winter, and every spring a new batch of them will come along. So the leaves are flying away, showing the, the dead warriors, or the dead uh, humans flying away from the world into uh, non-existence and this is the surrealistic element of it. Yeah, so the, this painting, uh, the, the Minotaur, I call it, is uh, based on a simple sentence that I saw on, on the paper one day. It says, there's a Minotaur inside every one of us. So I wanted to, um, from this sentence, I wanted to illustrate that, uh, that fact. So I um, decided to paint a minotaur that is uh, very menacing with uh, the, 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 f the head of a bull and the complete body of a man uh, that has just broken loose from, uh, from the wall to which he was attached. And the Minotaur has been released. And the Minotaur, when it is released, will engender a tremendous destruction. You already see at the bottom of his feet the pile of skulls that uh, he has consumed since the Minotaur only eats human flesh. And uh, next to it, you will see, also see there is uh, two elements that are not skulls. There is one head with a bullet hole in it and there is a um, football uh, next to it. So the head is actually the, uh, the head of Marcel Duchamp 
who actually invented modern art. Uh, that so many people have lambasted and wanted to kill. So the, this is uh, the fact that the minot when the Minotaur is released, even art is destroyed. And the football symbolizes the fact that despite all the atrocities that are going on around the world, the first thing that people care about is whether their football team is won that weekend or not. So this entire uh, painting illustrates the ominous uh, character of releasing the Minotaur inside of us. Uh, the Samsa ambiguity is a very complex painting and it um, illustrates one of the points I made earlier where uh, the uh, mythology and the ancient writings actually meet the modern world. And it shows uh, the connection of human thought between the very first Western book that we have, which is the Iliad, and the modern world of 2017 that we live in, illustrated by the high-speed train that is going into the tunnel. It also refers to the absurd character of man's uh, existence on Earth because the central um, person in the painting is uh, Franz Kafka. And Franz Kafka is there not only to remind us of the absurdity of human of the human condition but also to remind us that the absurd will win and will create havoc in human progress why because first of all in his writings kafka predicted the extermination camps he clearly stated these people do not like Jews, and sooner or later they will come and kill all of us. And in the background of the painting, you can see that there is the fence of the concentration camps. There are three uh, yellow stars, which symbolizes Kafka's mother and his two sisters who died in Auschwitz. And these branches, the branches of his thoughts, go into also his personal obsession with sex. Because again, we go to the point where the artists are motivated by uh, their sexual drive. And Franz Kafka was obsessed with women and with pornography. And the painting shows these two characters, uh, these two facets of his character, I should say, that go into the um, towers of the castle being Pharisees and into the creation of art linked to a woman uh, completing a sexual act. And of course, all this stuff is, um, is linked together by blood. The blood of the warriors, the blood of the slaves who built the modern buildings the blood of the writer, the blood of the artist who is creating his work in uh, either under oppression or with great sacrifice. And it is a painting in which the gods have become completely useless. The gods have uh, simply been reduced to a graffiti on a piece of wall.